What a dramatic resurrection story this is, this story from the Gospel of John that we read this year. You may remember, though, that the story we read last Easter was Matthew's version, which is equally dramatic and arguably more spectacular with special effects worthy of Hollywood, um, massive earthquakes that bust open the tomb, dazzling angels like space aliens sparkling with light, and of course, the zombie apocalypse. Who could forget it? It's action-packed, but John's version has a real, genuine, human, earthy realism to it. Grief, fear, angels, tears, and Jesus in disguise as a gardener. Of all these four versions, I love John, I think, the best. It is so detailed. Mary jumps to the conclusion immediately that the body has been stolen. Who wouldn't jump to that conclusion? A running back to get the others. And then they run back yet again, Peter and John. And, well, we don't know that it's John, do we? Peter and the other disciple. But the fact that he remembers this one little detail, that it was the other disciple who won the race. He just had to slip that in there. This is why scholars are pretty sure the other runner was John. I mean, Peter may have been head of the church, but let's face it, John was lighter and a little better on his feet. The details make it so plausible. He looks into the grave, both of them, all of them look into the grave, and they remember this detail, that the linen wrappings were in one area and the cloth that was on Jesus' face was folded neatly in another place. It almost gives you chills today to think about it. You see, the resurrection story, unless this is your first time ever in church, and if you are, welcome, but most of us Christians are used to the Easter story, but what a crazy one it is. It's Halloween in April, an open tomb, mummy wrappings lying in a pile. And then finally Mary's vision of Jesus that she is told not to touch. It must have come as a huge surprise and I'm guessing a dismay to Mary that it is left to her to explain the good news of the resurrection. She was a woman and in her day not allowed to testify in a court, be a legal witness, not, not to mention the fact that she had been healed of all these demons and was a person known to have heard and seen things in the past. You'd think that the divine maker of all would have chosen a better, more credible witness at least that's what I would have thought if I had been in her shoes. She wondered how she could ever make anyone believe. This is still a problem today for us, arguably maybe even a greater challenge in our world of science. But it might have given us some comfort to know that even in Jesus' day, this was a controversy. This was an active controversy. The Pharisees, the group that we often hear Jesus opposing in his ministry for their hypocrisy, they preached the resurrection of the dead. And Paul, you remember, Paul who wrote this letter to the Corinthians that was read first, Paul was a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were up against the establishment of that time. The Pharisees were the reformers, the Sadducees and the high priests and so forth in Jerusalem tended to believe not in the resurrection of the dead and to call it heresy. And if you want to remember why, think back to who really had the most spectacular belief in an afterlife, those notorious pagans who kept the Hebrew people slaves 
in Egypt. Those pyramids with the mummies and the jewels and all of the things that they were taking with them on their journey to the afterlife, this was false religion to the Jews. And then, of course, the Greeks with the Sharon, the boatman taking you across the river, sticks into the Elysian fields. Bunch of hooey to the Jews. And yet this group of Pharisees were preaching the resurrection for the, of the dead. And Jesus was preaching about the kingdom of heaven everywhere he went. A kingdom that was not of this world and yet was of this world. Even more perplexing, a belief that seemed to bridge all beliefs and name something else. A kingdom of heaven that was both very close to us, alive, present, like the Holy Spirit of love that binds human beings to human beings, but also something mysterious, eternal, future. So for us today, we have stories too. I was just in women's fellowship recently when somebody tentatively shared a story of what felt like a visitation from beyond. I always have looked forward to those moments in ministry when either I've sat with some of you in your grief and you've told me stories of miracles and wonder, or maybe even after. You'd come to my office and close the door and inevitably lower your voice to a whisper. My sister died and yet I could feel her present with me. I could swear I could feel her touch on my shoulder. My father lay dying, and he said he could see Jesus standing at the foot of his bed. Pastor, do you think that could be true? My husband came to me in a dream and said, he's okay now, he's happy. He's well and whole again in heaven. And you always look so afraid that I'll laugh at you. <laughs> but I won't laugh unless it's with joy because I believe it too. I've seen it too. One of the great privileges of ministry has been to stand on that, what one of my pastoral colleagues called the swinging bridge between life and death, where we stand white knuckled, praying for Jesus to come. And I've seen that spirit of the risen Christ emerge at those moments, even at my mother's own deathbed. I was so grateful for a pastoral colleague and mentor who had told me she was a, she was a chaplain in a dementia facility, and my mother had Alzheimer's. And she said, don't give up on her. There will be moments when you can glimpse once again the radiance of her spirit and sense the presence of Christ in eternity. Look for those moments. And in that last week of her life, after she had spent two years not speaking, not showing any expression at all, I had one of those moments when she suddenly brightened up with this glow and looked into the upper right corner of the room and spoke to her mother and to Jesus. We don't like for people to think we're crazy. So it is hard to tell the story. But those moments of certainty about God, about the presence of God alive, Christ with us. These make all the difference. The series that we're beginning after Easter is called Faith Matters. Faith Matters. Certainly, to believe gives us courage on our deathbeds. One of the 
things that most inspired me on a trip to Nemea in Greece. It's where for you, um, if you're like my father and you like sports. By the way, my dad texted me this morning to rejoice that the ACC still had a team in the NCAA finals and oh, by the way, happy Easter. <laughs> I took my father to see the stadium in Greece, in Nemea, which has the first tunnel where the athletes could enter. They built up the berm of the soil on either side, and that tunnel was a brilliant innovation. It was cool even in August in Greece. But there was a tragic story of a time when, um, oh, some of us of European heritage were raiding vandals from the north and massacring the Greeks. We pagan Europeans killing those good Christians. And they holed up there in that tunnel. It was the last hiding place that they had against the invaders. And they still have preserved inside the museum the rock wall carving of the last survivor. They carved in Greek, Zoe Aeonios, eternal life. And I like to think that in those moments, those last moments of life, that faith made a difference. That memory came rushing back to me as I read in the newspaper about one of the survivors in Kenya who was hiding under her bed in her dorm room. eternal life. So it matters, this faith that we have. It gives us the courage to proclaim our faith against sometimes frightening and impossible odds. It helps us in times of adversity, but it helps us in everyday life too. I, for many years in youth ministry, would remark on the kid who was the least likely to succeed, who would literally come back to life in the presence of what the church had to offer. I had a kid whose mom was a Vegas stripper once and was an angry drunk afterwards, raising a daughter. She needed the hope that the church had to offer. I held a child in the homeless shelter as our, as our young adults and our campus ministry group was reaching out in Christ's name. The presence of Christ was palpable in that place, embodied in my students and in the children that we were helping. Even Pope John Paul II back in 1990s shocked the world by saying, I don't think that you find hell by drilling down a few miles straight down from the Vatican. You find hell wherever people are separated from the love of God. We must never take for granted the faith that we share, the bodies that sit next to us in the pews, or the amazing grace of the saints in light who have gone before us. We are one body, Paul writes. We are now the living body of Christ. And if this resurrection that we proclaim is not true, it all would be in vain. My friend Penny had a church friend whose church was destroyed in the Goshen tornadoes of 1994 on Palm Sunday. You've maybe heard me tell this story before. Her four-year-old daughter was in the cherub choir and was killed that day. But do you know what they did a week later? That church set up folding chairs on the lawn facing their, the rubble of the foundation. And they hung a great big banner across the the building, what was left of it, that said, we live because he lives. 
And they stood up. They lost 20 of their members in one church service the week before. They stood and they sang, Christ the Lord is risen today that Easter, like they had never sung it before. They came to know what we all have proclaimed for generations, that we are the church, not the building. The people in the pews with us are the resurrection, the body of Christ. This is our belief. This is our call. Meet fear with hope, people of faith. Meet violence with peace. Meet hatred with love. Meet this world's endless brokenness and worry and stress with joy, with grace, with new life. It is our call and our heritage to be this Easter people. We carry his light and his likeness into the world once again. Thanks be to God for this good news. Amen.